Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Have you ever stopped to stop to think about the things mathematics just avoids? The mathematical no-go zones? Think about it. One divided by zero is undefined. Zero divided by zero has no meaning. And, and zero to the power of zero is ambiguous. These are the singularities, the points where our usual mathematical rules just break down. But what if these aren't errors? What if instead of being problems to avoid, they're actually valid numbers in a whole new system. That's what we're diving into today. We're taking the next step beyond the familiar and extending the virtual number system into a 3D number system, a system specifically designed to handle these so-called singularities properly. Now, this is just an introduction. We're laying the groundwork here. In future videos, we'll explore this fascinating system in much more depth delving into its operations and implications. So buckle up, because today we're about to redefine mathematics. Before we jump into building this new system, let's take a quick look at why our traditional systems fall short when faced with singularities. First, we have the 1D number system, or real number system. This is your everyday number line, dealing with all the numbers we typically use. It works great for basic arithmetic, but as soon as we try to divide by zero, it's, it simply breaks down. We get the undefined error. Then came the complex number system. They are 2D number system. This expanded our understanding of numbers by introducing imaginary numbers using the unit i, which is the square root of negative one. This system is incredibly powerful for things like electrical engineering and quantum mechanics. However, even with complex numbers, we still run into the same problems with singularities. Building on that, the virtual number system, which is also 2D number system, took another leap by introducing a new unit, J, defined as the natural logarithm of negative one. This system allowed us to explore even more mathematical landscapes. Yet, despite this expansion, we still can't handle singularities properly within its framework within its framework, and that's where our new idea comes in. To finally resolve this issue, we're introducing a 3D number system, where these singularities are not treated as problematic fractions or undefined expressions, but as fundamental units in their own right. The key to our 3D number system is the introduction of a third unit, which we'll call K. This K will be the cornerstone of representing singularities within our system. So in this 3D number system, a 3D number, which we can call D, is written in a specific form. D equals A plus B times J plus C times K. Let's break down what each part means. A, B, and C are your familiar real numbers, the ones you use every day. J is the unit from the virtual number system, which, as we mentioned, J equals the natural logarithm of negative 1. And here's the new part. K equals the natural logarithm of 0. This is our singularity unit. Now, instead of trying to force singularities into the mold of fractions, we're going to define them as fundamental unit numbers. This shift in perspective leads to some interesting consequences. Firstly, our unit k is fundamentally linked to division by zero. We define it as k equals the natural logarithm of zero. This definition follows from the properties of logarithms. Traditionally, the logarithm of zero is considered undefined. However, in our new system, we're not treating it as an error. Instead, we are defining it as a brand new number, our fundamental singularity unit, k. Secondly, our unit k inherently encodes infinite-like behavior. Consider the exponential function. We know that the exponential function of k, which is e to the power of k, is equal to zero. Based on this, we define e to the power of k equals zero to the power of n. Here, n represents any exponent. This connection links our singularity unit k to the concept of exponentiation, which we'll explore in more detail a bit later. Thirdly, our unit k allows singularity units to be treated algebraically. This is a crucial step. We're going to define two specific singularity units based on common problematic expressions. We'll define sigma equals 1 divided by 0, and we'll define phi equals 0 divided by 0. Now, unlike traditional mathematics, where these expressions 1 over 0 and 0 over 0 are labeled as undefined or having no meaning, we are treating them as valid numbers within the 3D number system. They are concrete units that we can manipulate algebraically. So now we have three distinct components in our number system. The familiar real number system, represented by A. The virtual number system, represented by B times J and now the singularity system represented by c times k. 
By introducing K and defining singularities as fundamental units, we can now treat them as an integral part of a consistent number system, rather than as mathematical roadblocks or errors to be avoided. Now, to truly understand how to work with singularities, we need to define how they behave under exponentiation. In classical mathematics, the exponential function e to the power of x is often defined using an infinite series. e to the power of x equals the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the power of n divided by n factorial mass. That looks a little complex, but it's the standard way to define the exponential function. For our singularity unit k, we've already established that e to the power of k equals 0 to the power of n. Now, the interesting thing about 0 to the power of n is that it behaves differently depending on the value of n. This means we get different results based on the exponent. If n is greater than 0, like 1, 2, 3, and so on, then 0 to the power of n equals 0. If n is equal to 0, then 0 to the power of 0 equals 1. This is a convention often used in mathematics, although it's sometimes debated. If n is less than 0, like negative 1, negative 2, and so on, then 0 to the power of n becomes undefined in the real number system, often representing infinity. This crucial observation tells us that e to the power of k is not a single fixed value. Instead, it's more like a function that depends on the exponent n. Therefore, we redefine singularity exponentiation as e to the power of k equals f of n, where f of n is a function that depends on the sign of the exponent n. It takes on different values depending on whether n is positive, zero, or negative. This leads us to the first fundamental property of singularities within our 3D system. Zero to the power of zero equals one. Zero to the power of n equals zero for any n greater than zero. Zero to the power of n equals sigma for any n less than zero. This set of definitions provides a consistent framework for handling expressions involving singularities in equations within our new system. Now that we've laid down the rules for singularity exponentiation, let's move on to explore the multiplication properties within our 3D number system, specifically focusing on how our singularity unit k behaves. We've established that k equals the natural logarithm of zero. From the definition of logarithms, this directly implies that e to the power of k equals zero. Now, let's do a little algebraic manipulation. If we multiply both sides of this equation by e to the power of negative k, we get e to the power of k times e to the power of negative k equals zero times e to the power of negative k. Recall that we previously defined sigma equals one divided by zero. In our system, we are equating e to the power of negative k with this singularity unit sigma. So we can rewrite the right side of our equation, zero times sigma equals zero. This confirms a crucial identity within our singularity system, zero times sigma equals zero. This might seem intuitive, uh, but it's important because it tells us that multiplying zero by our singularity unit sigma still results in zero. This is different from how you might expect fractions to behave under traditional arithmetic rules, highlighting that our singularity units operate under their own defined principles. We've already established that zero to the power of zero equals one. However, simply treating zero divided by zero in the same way can lead to inconsistencies within our system. Instead of considering it as a standard fraction, we are defining it as its own fundamental unit, which we called phi, phi. Phi equals zero divided by zero. This means that in our singularity mathematics, phi behaves as a basic indivisible unit rather than a fraction that can be simplified. With this definition, we establish a key property that helps maintain consistency within our system. Phi times sigma equals sigma. This rule dictates how our two fundamental singularity units, phi, 0 divided by 0, and sigma, 1 divided by 0, interact under multiplication. And there you have it. We've laid the very foundation for our 3D number system, redefining how we approach and handle singularities. Instead of seeing them as mathematical errors or undefined expressions, we're embracing them as fundamental unit values within a new, consistent framework. Remember, this is just the beginning of our exploration. In future videos, we'll delve deeper into this fascinating 3D number system. We'll explore the rules for division, delve further into the intricacies of exponentiation, and uncover even more deeper properties of these singularity units. So definitely stay tuned for more mathematical breakthroughs. If you found this introduction interesting and thought-provoking, 
please hit that like button, leave a comment below sharing your thoughts, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more explorations into the frontiers of mathematics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.